All right, welcome back, everybody. And uh, when we're having lecture or conversation, there's no technology allowed in class, so please turn your monitor sideways because it's just too dang hard. We're all addicts, aren't we? You know, it's just too hard not to look at the glow box. We're like a bunch of moths who just want to fly into the appealing light of Facebook or Reddit or whatever your addiction might be. Uh, so turn your monitor sideways and your cell phone should be put away, no using your cell phones or anything like that. We're going to be talking and learning stuff and so I want you guys to focus in. What's one of the secrets to success? Talked about it last week, starts with F. Focus, right? You got to know how to focus. If you take light and you focus it, it could burn through steel. If you are focused, you set your number one priority, you say, you know what, my number one priority is I want to get a college education, I want to get my master's degree, I want to get my doctorate. And that's my number one priority. Come hell or high water, I'm getting my doctorate. You will get your doctorate. That's it. I didn't get my doctorate because I didn't have that perspective when I was young. I had the perspective of like, okay, I just want to get done with school because I thought that when you're done with school, then there was no more work or something. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. <laughs> got done with school and then it was like, ah, what do I do now? I actually got to work. Eight to five, this sucks. So make the most of it while you're in school. And, uh, you know, welcome to the blue collar working class. I, I, I have some bad news to share with you all. You were not born wealthy, <laughs> most likely, because you're, you're here and you've got a yoke around your neck. Get used to it, because odds are you're not going to win the lottery. So work, work hard, pull that plow, and by that I mean study, right? Get your focus on and get your priorities straight and get, you know, a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a doctorate, because that's the pass key to the middle class and making more money and working less, right? And statistically, that's the most uh, guaranteed route for you to take to be able to have a secure financial future. So uh, I'm going to help you with focus by having you turn your monitors and turn your cell phones off. And, uh, and if I look and I see that you're like texting, uh, what do you have to do? I say, hey, you're texting. Are you texting? You'll say, yeah. Right? And I say, okay, what do you do now? Do you guys remember from last week? You like stand up. Yeah, like you're an addict. You gotta stand up and say, "Hey, my name's Todd, and I'm addicted to technology." And we'll say, "Hey, welcome, Todd. A lot of us here have that problem. We're glad you're here." Just like as if you're in an Alcoholics Anonymous program or Narcotics Anonymous or Anonymous whatever, but you are Tech Addict Anonymous. All right. So when we talk, we talk and we learn. We focus. That's a really important skill. If you can take that out in life, it'll serve you well. Put that phone away. Put it away. Right? It's hard. I know. Because I used to not have a phone. I used to be like, what are these people doing? Driving, looking at their phone. Now I'm all like, okay, I got to dial that number. Wait, what am I doing? Right? Hypocrite. I used to tell people not to do it. And every now and then I catch myself driving and dialing. And it's like, I got to stop that. Right? Right? Technology. Does it use us? <laughs> Does you use it? Whatever. You know, how do we use it? So. Did you put off having a phone or something? Or? Yeah, just for a long time. Like, I was like, I'm the tech teacher who doesn't use tech. And uh, I just went through a phase in my life. When did you finally get a phone? Uh, my uh, ex-wife bought me one. She wanted to be able to call me. All right. She paid for it. That's cool. That was, like, right when we got divorced, like, 2006, 2007. And then uh, that went away after a year or so. And then I just, I don't know, I don't know if I had one, I can't remember. But then for a long time, like I just got my first, uh, whatever, smartphone, like about a year ago, like maybe December of 2014. <laughs> and uh, it was a, a Samsung. Who's turning on their computer and why? <laughs> you don't need your computer on right now. All right, so first things first, you want to make rent, you want to make your money. And so you should already, you know, and that's an analogy for you want to, like, do what you need to do during your grade. So last week we did uh, Windows 7. You should be done with that assessment. Done. This week you should go into Word, and you should do uh, assessments, and you should do the first assessment here in Word, right? So that, or, sorry, that one right there. You should do that Word assessment right there. You should be done with that this week. And uh, that's all going to come, and then you can look in exams. And uh, chapter quizzes, you need to do chapter two, right there. And look more in exams. I don't know why I'm looking up there. Just look at mine here. 
And uh, you can look in here and say, hey, office lab tests, am I ready to do any of these? Nah, you'll do the word one after you've done all the word sections. So you don't have to do any of those. So uh, this week here in my IT lab, just word assessment one and quiz two, right, in my IT lab. Over in Blackboard, anything to do under announcements? No. Syllabus? No. Lectures? Well, I could go in and I could watch lectures, but you're here, so you're watching them here. Or you're watching it online. Uh, that one, assignments. We are going to have assignments. I'm just looking at the screen and making sure I'm capturing the right thing. And you should do week two, your goals, your calendar, and programming. So all that should be done. You should be up through those, those things to be on pace. And uh, if you're not doing that stuff, get on it, because that's where you make rent, okay? You're saying we should have that done by Monday, right? Yeah, yeah, you should have that done by Monday, but that's where you should be. So it's not actually all that much work. Uh, who has a textbook? You brought one? Sweet. You mind if I borrow it? I forgot mine. All right, I'll come get it in a second when I just want to review the terminology. Uh, I don't know what Chapter 2 talks about in your textbook, but this is what we're talking about this week, and we'll talk about Chapter 2 in a second. So this is like the lecture stuff, and this is what you should know at the end of class. In about 40 minutes or 50 minutes, you'll know what all this means. Circuits and switches, right, how those relate to computers. Coding schemes, how coding schemes relate to computers. What binary means, what 2 to the power of n, how that's connected to computers, and you know, what we think about that. That there's something called the five generations of computers. There's also this thing called Moore's Law. And then you'll know all about bits, bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and what that all means, and machine language. All right, so that's what you're going to know. Basically, at the end of today's class, you'll know how computers work. How cool is that? All right. So uh, this, is, this is what you have to wrap your head around. You ready? Focus in. Not everybody's focused in. Wait till everybody's focused in. You're really focused in. <laughs> so uh, computers run on electricity. And electricity can be on or off. And those are two states. And based upon something being on or off, we could, we could encode a message into that. So think about Halloween. The porch light is on. What's it mean on Halloween? Come get it. Come trick or treat, right? And the porch light is off at a house on Halloween. What's it mean? Scrooge. Right? Like, don't go up to that door. And so we've taken one circuit that could be on or off, and we have encoded two messages into that circuit, right? And we're conveying that information to people. So if the circuit is on, it means come trick or treat. And if it's off, it means don't come trick or treat. So one circuit two messages. What about if we had two circuits? If we had two light bulbs, we live in this house, two-story house, you know, leave it to beaver style, 1950s America, whatever, and across the street's our best friend, two-story house, and I have two flashlights that I can hold at my window. How many messages, not using Morse code, but just leaving the lights on or off, how many messages could I convey to my friend across the street with two lights, two circuits, two switches? Four. Yeah, four. Because they could both be on, they could both be off, one could be on and another could be off, or vice versa, right? So there's four different possibilities, four combinations, the arrangement of those circuits, and I could send four messages because I could tell my friend, hey, both lights are on, we're whatever, you know, and if both are off, then it means this. And if it's like that, it means another thing. If it's like this, it means yet one more thing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how computers work. <laughs> That's it. And that's, you know, they're switches, they're circuits, same word. They could be on or off, and we just say, hey, based upon whether or not that circuit or switch is on or off, it means something, you know? And so we have, instead of just one being, you know, a light switch on the porch, or two being, you know, two flashlights, you know, like, oh, two, I'm not going to be able to store very many messages, but we'll have, like, maybe eight. We'll have maybe eight circuits. Right? And eight circuits is a, a special word for that. So we call each circuit, uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but you'll, you, you'll hear the phrase circuit or switch or transistor and, and a switch, just like a light switch, on or off. A circuit, right? On or off. Or a transistor can be on or off. Uh, and so you'll hear that used interchangeably. And so that's, that's the entire concept right there. And so if we had eight lights, how many different messages could we store? Ooh, a good guess, right? But it's actually 2 to the power of n. That's what that 2 to the n is all about right there. So if we have one light, right, 2 to the power of 1, 
we could do two messages. If we have two lights, two to the power of two, we could do four messages. If we have three lights, two to the power of three, we could do two times two times two, which is two, four, eight. We could do eight messages. And if we have four, we could do two times two times two times two, which is two, four, eight, sixteen. And five, thirty-two. And six, sixty-four. And seven, uh, 128 and 8, 256. Do these numbers sound like computers? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. You hear those numbers with computers, right? They're too young to remember RAM at that level. One gigabyte, two yeah. gigabyte. <laughs> you guys yeah. don't remember RAM at that level. Okay. I'm dating myself. Anybody, how many people know, like, oh, those numbers, I've seen those associated with computers? Wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, so that's, uh, that, those, those, are, uh, those are circuits and switches, and then we create coding schemes, and we just say, hey, this arrangement of circuits and switches in an on-off position means one thing, and that arrangement means another thing, right? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I'm just wondering if I want to say anything more about coding schemes. And, and so that, that's, that's it. That's how computers work. This is what I wanted to say. That flaw was fleeting in my head for a second, but it just came back. So... You might, this is, this is where computers are amazing, right? Because we're, we're talking about a porch light or two flashlights. Billions, there are billions of circuits and switches, right? Billions of little switches that could either be on or off on a silicon chip the size and thickness of your thumbnail. Billions. So that's just like a mind-boggling achievement of humanity. That they've taken, there's a, there, there are two switches, three switches right over there on the wall, right? Big. They've put billions on the, of those on something the size of your thumbnail, and they can look at them and they can check them. They can see how many, what, what state they're in, and you can do that instantly, practically, you know? So we could start storing things. So here's a little walkthrough with pictures. So electricity has two states on or off. If I have one light, I could store two messages, come trick or treat, go away. Right, so that's one light. If I have two lights, I could store four messages, go away, come in, bring pizza, bring beer. So that's like the leave it to beaver analogy with my flashlights and my bedroom window, right? You guys all remember leave it to beaver, no? How many people know, don't know, how many people don't know leave it to beaver? Right, it's a great TV show. He, he, he and Haskell, what was that kid's name? Drank beer all the time. Eddie Haskell. It's kind of racy for the 50s. I'm joking. If I have three lights, I could do 16. <clears throat> messages and I could just create my own coding scheme instead of having to write out off on off on all the time I could just use zeros and ones right zeros are off ones are on so that's a shorthand notation oh now I understand why we always have zeros and ones associated with computers because that's all that's going through a computer zeros and ones that's it and all it represents are different switches in on off configuration different configurations of on and off Right? So there's a coding scheme I created. Or I could create another coding scheme and I could put them together with the letters of the alphabet. You know? And then I could do puzzles like, okay, what does that mean? And I could start to string the different zeros and ones together with my coding scheme to put together words. That's all I could come up with those letters, sorry. That was a bad cap. How many people got it? Raise your hand. How many people don't have it? Raise your hand. That's it. That's it. We're done, man. You guys know how computers work. <laughs> it's kind of a trip, huh? No? It's not a trip? It trips me out. Because, like, here is, like, you know, a graph that shows the number of transistors they've been able to put onto a chip. And back in 1971, they could put 2,300. Wow, that's a lot. But today, you know, and this is like 2008, this is like 10 years old almost, 2 billion. What? That's crazy. So there's something called generations of computers. When we first started creating computers back in the 50s, I scared her out of class. She's like, to hell with this class. Ugh, screw that, dude. This is crazy. So you put two billion on those little chips. That was 2008. That was like decades ago in computer time. Was it double? Yeah, two billion back in 2008. Wow. Doesn't it kind of double um, every year and a half or something? Uh, transistors on chip. Transistors on chip. 
Transistor count, I haven't seen this. And so here's the new one, 2011. They're up to 2.6 billion in 2011. Two billion on and off switches that you can say, show me those 13 million, what arrangement they are, and <sighs> zeros and ones go flying through. And then the computer can look at that and say, this is an image of whatever, or this is a song, and play it for you. Zeros and ones, that's it. Movies, music, pictures, that's the matrix, right? You think you're looking at people and videos, you're looking at zeros and ones. All right, yep, yep, yep. so when computers uh, first started, they uh, were created with vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes were, here we go, they were like, uh, you know, they could hold an on-off state and it could be checked electronically while there was an on-off state. And these are about the size of a light bulb. And that was called the first generation of computers. And, uh, you know, you could look at like ENIAC and you could see like, you know, what an old computer looked like. And, uh, you know, um, and then there was, uh, you know, when they would debug the computer, the moths would fly into the computer and then screw up the vacuum tubes and die because it was warm. I didn't know that. And so they go in and debug the computer and actually take the bugs out. Relay number 70, panel F, there's a moth in the relay, right? That's where debugging a computer came from. Grace Hopper was a woman, you know, computer person back in the 50s. So that was like the 1950s, vacuum tubes and ENIAC, and that's how we did on-off switches and checked them, and, and there's like maybe 2,300, I don't know, ENIAC, ENIAC vacuum tubes. Um, let's see, ENIAC tubes. Uh, contain 17,468 vacuum tubes. That's it, right? And today is 2.6 billion. So that was like 1946, 1950. So that's the first generation. And then the second generation computer were transistors. And transist vacuum tubes would burn out every uh, seven seconds, seven minutes, or you know, whatever. Not, they wouldn't last very long. And you'd have one go out. You could run for about seven minutes. And, uh, but transistors were cool. They were smaller. They went, they went from something the size of a light bulb down to about the size of a dime or a quarter. Right, and uh, and they didn't burn out. So that was second generation computers and transistors could store on-off states. And then we had integrated circuits, also known as chips, and uh, and those were built on silicon wafers. And so silicon wafer looks like this. Hey, there was a nice image. So there's a silicon wafer, and you can see on the silicon wafer there's like a grid-like structure to it. There's one in here I saw. Right, you can see that grid-like structure on this image right there. And, uh, and if you look up really, oh, there it is right there. And so you, you print, each of these are individual chips, and you print a whole bunch of them on one wafer, and then you cut them, and that would be like one chip that would go into one device, one CPU or something. And so that's, uh, those are a bunch of little on-off switches, switches, transistors, circuits, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, on that one little chip. So that one little chip today, or in 2011, 2.6 billion circuits on it. So that's the third generation of computers. That was like in the 70s. I'm not sure actually when that came out. That might have been in the 60s. I don't care about dates. And then we have the microprocessor, the CPU, and that started in 1971. Intel, which many people think stands for intelligence, right? Seems like a good association. But it stands for integrated electronics. But of course, they probably also meant the other association too. Intel invented the CPU, which just brought together some main processing components into one unit. And uh, that was in 1971. They did it under contract for a Japanese company, asked them to build it. And then once they built it, they realized what we've built is so valuable. We're not going to sell it to this Japanese company. We'll give you what we built because we promise we provide you with that. But we're keeping the technology and you don't owe us anything. And then they went on to become a CPU company. And that was founded by Gordon Moore and some other dude. And uh, Gordon Moore, who's right there, um, you know, uh, he, um, sorry, I got crap on my laptop, whatever that is. He, um, 
you know, Gordon Moore and one other guy founded Intel right up in the Silicon Valley. And you could go up to the Intel Museum if you're ever passing through San Jose. And, um, you know, here's directions to it. And you can see, you know, there it is right there. And here we are right here, right? But that's the Intel Museum. And you can see, uh, you know, it's where they've made some chips. And you can see the history of it. And it's kind of a cool experience. One other museum which is good to know about is Museum of Computer San Jose. I'm just not getting it right. History of Computer, Computer History Museum. And that's right here next to Google. And so there's Google's private airport. They have their own airport. That's pretty cool. And this is all Google right here. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's the Computer History Museum which is also a really cool place to visit and just sort of check it out. So if you're ever passing through uh, San Jose, you go to Intel's museum, and you can go to the Computer History Museum. And by the way, they have a replica of Charles Babbage's whatever machine, analytical engine, difference engine. And, uh, and this was like the first computer back in the day, and we'll talk more about that in a second. I'll just leave that there. And so that's it. So what's the fifth generation of computers? Uh, it's still up for debate. Maybe it's artificial intelligence. Uh, but it might also be uh, quantum computing. So you could Google quantum computer. Google has a quantum computing lab now, and that's pretty awesome. And, but you Google quantum AI lab team. Quantum and AI are pretty closely associated. But quantum computers uh, <coughs> completely rethink the whole deal. And uh, I'm not totally sure how all quantum computers work, but it's really technical, really difficult, and it has to be really cold. But it looks pretty awesome. And apparently, you could do amazing things. So uh, these will be the types of algorithms that will be like, you know, telling us, Todd, uh, we notice that the way you're living your life, uh, maybe you should rethink uh, this. And instead of that, get these two degrees and then go for that job. And that will give you an 18% salary boost in six months with 97% probability. Would you be interested in that? Sure. Yeah, I'll take those classes, sure, no problem. <laughs> uh, AI, quantum computing is amazing. All right, so blah, blah, blah. Main takeaway so far? Uh, I feel like I've talked a lot. Is Moore's Law still applicable? Yeah, that's accurate? a great question. So let's, uh, let's, let's Let's talk about Moore's Law, and then we'll take a pause. So Gordon Moore said, hey, you know, the amount of processors, the amount of uh, tr circuits, transistors on a chip will double every 18 months. And uh, that was his goal for his company, and you could see he made that happen, right? And he called that Moore's Law, that the transistor count is doubling every 18 months. And so it goes from 2,300 to 4,600 to, you know, 10,000, whatever. You could see the doubling there. And so uh, does Moore's Law, has Moore's Law failed? Moore's Law still true? And, uh, you know, and the stuff that I've seen um, is that uh, Moore's Law is slowing down. Oh. But uh, Moore's Law keeps going, defying expectations, Scientific America, in May 19, 2015. So I guess so, man. This looks like a pretty good article. But what they've started to do is instead of trying to pack more CPUs onto one, more transistors onto one CPU, let's just give you more CPUs. And so you have dual cores, quad cores, and then how do we take advantage of that? Um, I'm just looking here to see if there's anything in here about how many transistors. The Moore's Law, how they used to like program for the computer that would be available in a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I always wondered, like, well, how are they program How are they running it to check? Well, just, you'd like, run it, but your like, computer would be yeah. really slow running it, and, but in uh, 18 months, computers would be twice as powerful, and so then it'd run twice as fast, right? Simply and answer. so, yeah, they, yeah. they build it on machines, you know, um, so, it wasn't meant yeah. For, it was meant for better machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Hmm. I mean, that's my take. I don't have the absolute answers. All right, you guys ready for more, or do you want to take a break? Okay. You ready for more? <laughs> How many people are ready for more? Raise your hand. How many people want a break? Raise your hand. Okay, jump up. This is your break. Let's do some jumping jacks, Gary. You ready? Get up. Let's go. Get that blood flowing. Let's go. Come on, jump up. Everybody, get up.
We have somebody else for a break. Don't make him stand up on his own. Get up. You ready? Get up. Are you really get the, get, No, I'm joking. Get up. Get up. It means your butt leaves your seat. Get up. Get up. He's he's like, oh, hell with this. I'm getting out of this class. Get another person out. Good. That's the last stuff I have to grade. Are you ready? Let's go. One, two, three, four, five. Come on. Get that blood flowing. What? You can only do this in PE? Why are you still sitting in your seat? Get up. Get up, get up, get up, get up. I haven't stopped. Why are you guys stopping? All right, sit back down. Don't be too cool for school. You'll miss out on the fun. It's the fool who plays it cool, right? That's what John Lennon said. Carries the weight of the world upon his shoulder. I've done that too much in my life. Don't let it happen to you. All right. So Moore's Law, so circuit switches, transistors, gates, all pretty much the same thing. I'll let you read that. So here's a little thing, right? 2 to the power of n, just representing that again. 2 to the power of n. 16 lights would be 65,000 things, or 16 you know, switches, circuits, transistors, zeros and ones. 32 lights would be that many. And uh, these zeros and ones, we call them binary. Bi because bicycle, biplane, right? It means two. So binary digits. Right? We have two digits. We got zero and one. We got off and on. Zero's off, one's on. And we abbreviate binary digits at, to be bits. So when we talk about bits, right, we're talking about a single bit. We're talking about either a zero or a one. It's a binary digit. Binary because bi is two. And that's computers. Right? So single bit. So uh, we can measure bits. And at the very beginning, we have one bit. And then with eight bits, we call that a byte. And with, uh, with 1,000 bytes, it's actually 1,024, but just keeping it simple. 1,000 bytes, that's a kilobyte. And 1,000 kilobytes, that's a megabyte. And 1,000 megabytes, that's a gigabyte. And 1,000 gigabytes, that's a terabyte. So if you do the math on all that, it works out to be 1,000 bytes is actually 8,000 bits, right? Because you got 1,000 bytes, and a byte's worth 8 bits, so you got 8 times 1,000, 8,000. Or you have 8 million bits. 8 million single zeros and ones for a megabyte. Or you got 8 billion single zeros and ones for a gigabyte. So your 32 gigabyte flash drive, your 32 gigabyte flash drive has 32 times 8, which is 256, 256 billion zeros and ones. Your 32 gigabyte flash drive has 256 billion zeros and ones that it could store. That, that means it has 256 billion on-off switches that it could flip. What the heck? Right? Because a flash drive is about the size of a key. Like, we're talking like some people did some work to make this happen. Like, if you, if you, if, if, if you, when we all die, there's a heaven and a hell, and you end up going to the fiery place, like, this might be what the devil will say to you. Welcome to hell. Now I want you to put 32 on-off switches on something the size of your thumbnail. Oh, I could never do that. You know how long that take? You have all of eternity. Yeah. Okay. That'd take forever. That'd be like hell, dude. Like, put 32, 256 billion on-off switches into a little flash drive and then be able to read which one's on and off. All right, so that's how you measure them. It all comes back to zeros and ones. How many bits are in, a, in, in a two kilobytes? In, in two kilobytes. How many bits are in two kilobytes? How many single zeros and ones in two kilobytes? Um. 16,000, right? Yes. How many bits are in two terabytes? 16. I don't even know what that is. Is it billion trillion? So it'd be sixteen trillion. That's right, sixteen trillion. So get rid of that. We're done with that one. 
So on off, one, zero, binary digits, bits, machine language, those are all pretty much the same thing, right? Machine language, that's the language computers speak, which is zeros and ones. And binary digits and bits, that's, you know, machine language, that's all the same thing. Kind of cool, huh? Hmm. Look on the back of these computers. What do you see? Oh, on off. Zero one. Mm -hmm. It's a zero and a one brought together. That's on off. That's your mm -hmm. on off button. That's why there's a zero one there. Go to zero, go to one. Mm -hmm. Go from one, go to zero. Oh. That's kind of cool, huh? Learning what symbols represent. All pro programs are written in a programming language and then translated to machine language. So we don't write programs by sitting down and typing in zeros and ones. That would be horrible. We write programs in uh, abstraction and then that gets translated or compiled down to zeros and ones and then the computer can run it. And when it's compiled down to zeros and ones, hey, that's machine language. It's ready to run. Computers do four things. Input process, output storage. The first computer, uh, some people say, is the abacus or whatever, right? There's this dude in the 1700s called Charles Babbage who invented this thing, an analytical engine, the difference engine, and it was a mechanical engine that could receive input, it could process that input, it could produce output, and it could store the results. Pretty amazing that he invented a machine that could do all of that. He drew the blueprints for it, but he couldn't get it to work because the machining on the gears was not precise enough. And uh, so he died never seeing it being successfully created, but because we have such good machining today, can make gears precise enough, using his blueprints, people were able to build it and it works. Wow. Right? But he died thinking, ah, eh, I blew it. Because the reason he wanted to create this was because they had shipping tables because England was a big mercantile or whatever country, right? They did a lot of that stuff. And, uh, and they had shipping tables. And then they had humans whose jobs were to compute calculations and figure out, okay, this far, this far, this is whatever, the distance, the amount. And those humans were called calculators. That's what their, those humans were called computers. That was the name of their job. So they were called computers because they would compute, right? And, uh, and they were always making errors in the shipping tables, human errors, right? And so he wanted to create a machine which could do it. And um, uh, he never saw it, but that, he came up with this idea that, that it needs to be able to receive input and then it needs to be able to process that and then it has to produce output and has to store it. You could go onto YouTube and search, you know, Difference Engine or Analytical Engine or Charles Babbage and see a video of this running. If you go to the Computer History Museum in San Jose, you'll actually be able to see them run it like twice a day. It's kind of cool. So those are four things computers do. IPOS, input process, output storage. We're going to take a look at processing and storage here briefly. You could also think of storage as memory. You could also think of storage as memory. I had this really great diagram. What happened to it? I don't want to go dig for it live. I don't want to draw. I guess I could draw on this board. And I have a pen. That motivates me. All right, let's draw. But first, before we draw an exercise, why? So we're going to talk about processing. We're going to talk about storage. So here's a little exercise. Are you guys ready? What is 2 plus 7? Nine. Okay, so for that to happen, you had to receive input, you had to have memory, 
right, and hold that input that came in. And then when you received all of the instructions, you had to process that, and then you had to output the results. So you needed input, storage, processing, and output. Input, storage, processing, output for all of that to occur, right? And without storage, I'd be like, what is two plus? You'd be like, what do you want me to add? Two? What do you want me to do with two? Plus? What do you want me to add? You just want to be remembering the previous thing. You've got to have memory. Same reason you need memory, computers need memory. So let's look at memory. Sorry, I just want to record this for people. That's it. That's all the board I got. CPU <coughs> and inside the CPU uh, there's different things in here like your arithmetic logic unit and your control unit and I don't even know what this stuff does but it's just different little components inside of it and then there's also something in here called cache and there's something else in here called registers and so uh, cache and registers, these are places where the computer can remember zeros and ones and they're right inside the CPU so they're really fast. And then we have, you know, sometimes we'll have a little bit more cache right here, right next to the CPU. And then we have RAM right here. And this is also sometimes known as memory. And it stands for random access memory, random access memory. And it's uh, random because you could randomly just say, go to this place, now go to that place, now go to this place. And you could get it from any section, right? As opposed to like sequential access, which means that you, uh, you are, you know, it's kind of like a tape, right? A cassette tape. You want to get to song nine, you got to fast forward, fast, fast one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's sequential access. And random access or direct access, sometimes it's called, be like a CD. You want to get to song nine? The playhead just jumps to song nine. You don't have to fast forward past anything. So this is random access, memory. This makes your computer work better. The more of this that you have, the better. Because everything the computer does, it loads it into memory, right? But when the power goes off, everything stored over here is gone. This is all supported by, by electricity. Though increasingly, we're starting to see solid state, right? And so solid state might start being used for RAM eventually, though I'm not aware of that yet. And then over here, we have, this is known also as primary storage. Or, or pri primary, and here we have secondary, we'll call it secondary storage. I, and I just like to use uh, storage for over here, that's why pri primary memory and secondary storage. So these are all just interchangeable. Primary memory, RAM, memory, and then we have secondary storage. And secondary storage would be like your hard disk drives, hard disk drives are your solid state drives, which are electronic drives, kind of like big flash drives. Right? Or your CDs, DVDs, or, uh, so usually when I talk about this stuff, I organize it a little bit different. So I, I organize it like this. I say magnetic, magnetic, and then I say solid state, and I say optical. And under optical would be CDs and DVDs, and under solid state would be like flash drives or solid state drives. And our magnetic would be like hard disk drives or tape. And back in the day, we had floppy. And uh, let me just move this camera over a little to capture all that. There we go. And then, um, so uh, this will hold a lot over here. And it's slow. So that's the characteristics over on this side. This holds a, a 
very little, and it's fast. Right? And, and it's like a continuum or a spectrum between these two. So this holds, you know, medium and it's medium. <laughs> And uh, everything on this side goes off with power, so we call that volatile. So when the power goes out, everything over here goes out, and this stuff stays on. And what we're talking about here is memory, remembering, computer remembering. And so computer remembering happens in secondary storage, whether it's magnetic like a hard disk drive or solid state like a solid state drive or a flash drive or optical like a CD or DVD, right? That's computer remembering occurring right there. This is all permanent. The power goes off. Everything's still stored here. And then over here, we have uh, computer remembering happening, happening in RAM and we have computer remembering happening in cache and we have computer remembering happening in more cache and registers. This would be like L1 cache, L2 cache, level 1 cache, level 2 cache. What's up? So then for the same for your external too? Yeah, so external hard drive? Yeah. That will be right over here. Okay. So that's all computer remembering. So when a computer is going to run a program, it uh, loads that program into RAM. And when you have data, it puts that data into RAM. So you tell it to start Microsoft Word, it goes and gets the code for Microsoft Word off of your hard disk drive and puts all that code into RAM and then it's running. Because RAM is fast, is, it, your hard drive is not fast enough to seamlessly run a program without it being hitchy or weird. So you got to put it in RAM because RAM's faster. But RAM can't hold everything your hard drive can hold. Your hard drive can hold terabytes. Your RAM's, you know, I don't know how much, how, how big's your RAM? Eight, 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes? 256. 256 gigabytes? Nice. No, no. Kilobytes. Kilobytes. <laughs> so, uh, and then there's one other little place where there's some remembering going on, and it's called uh, ROM. <coughs> And ROM stands for read-only memory, read-only memory. And on ROM is stored something called BIOS, which stands for basic input-output software. Because when your computer starts, there's no code in here. All that stuff's been cleaned out. How does it even know how to talk to the hard drive? We can't load instructions for it to talk to the hard drive if the instructions are on the hard drive. <laughs> You can't put the instructions for how to talk to the hard drive on the hard drive. There's nothing stored here, so they had to create this special area to store things. You can watch this later at home. And this is called read-only memory. And originally it was just broken switches, right? Circuits that were permanently either in an on state or permanently in an off state, and that was your code. And so it could go and it could read those, it'd turn the power on, and there would be zeros and ones, open circuits, closed circuits, always in that state, right? And that would be software to give it basic input and output abilities. That's why we call it basic input-output software. And then, oh, okay, now I know how to talk to the hard drive. I could go load the operating system. And you could go into BIOS when your computer's starting sometimes, or you could Google your computer model and say, enter BIOS. It'll tell you shortcut key. And when your computer's starting, you hit those shortcut keys, and it brings up like the startup menu or the BIOS setup, and you could do low-level configuration. <clears throat> so before it even loads your operating system, you could configure how, like a password at your BIOS level, which is kind of cool. Or you could change your boot order, and you could say, you know what, don't look to the hard drive for my OS. I want you to look to, uh, um, I want you to look to my CD drive or DVD drive or my flash drive. And now I can put a new OS on my flash drive and then look there and it'll load the new OS and I can install a new OS. I can change the boot order. That's called the boot order. So that's also when you can have it go to boot up something that you want, that you want to do all the time. Go to a certain program, right? Yeah, or so if I, I you know. Go, so I wanted to go 
to Microsoft Word right now. Well, that'd be different. You just okay. throw that in your start menu in, okay. in Windows. Okay. Yeah, just drop Microsoft Word in your start menu, and then okay. I'll always start it. But this is if I want to put a new operating system on my computer. Okay. All right. Yeah. This is a good question, though. Turn that back on for you. Please? There you go. Give it a second. Sorry. Boop, 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 boop. Let me change this. All right, so computers need memory or storage, right? You could use that interchangeably. We did this little exercise, why do we need memory, two plus three what, right? Cache is one place where you remember stuff. We saw that. Registers are another place. Registers are in the CPU. RAM, memory is another place computers remember things. There are pictures of RAM. That's what it looks like. ROM is another place, read-only memory. That's where BIOS is stored. And, uh, you know, we talked about that. And here's a screenshot of entering BIOS. And then here's your motherboard, and you can see some of the stuff actually here. Like these slots right here would be for RAM, these purple slots. And here's your CPU. And then this is like ROM down here. No, that's probably the ROM. And then that's the battery giving an ongoing trickle of electricity to ROM. Um, some computers today, you know, I don't think they still use the battery. I think they just use solid state. And uh, that's called the motherboard, what we were just looking at right there motherboard. It's kind of like the mother in a family holds everything together, at least if you had a good one, right? The motherboard and computer holds everything, connects everything. So that's where all the stuff plugs into. That big white square would be where the CPU would plug into. And all those little holes are pins that are connecting, you know, wires basically. And uh, this is called the system unit, the case, and you can see some of the different things that, you know, are inside there. So we have like the fan, up here are the power fan, power supply, you know, you know, like a CD drive, you know, or a DVD player, or that's a floppy drive. That's where your RAM would go. There's your RAM modules. Here's your CPU. These are expansion slots right there. There's an expansion card. This is like an old system unit case. I mean, not the kind we have in here, but like the kind down here under this table. Um, and then inside there, you have things called buses. So just like you and I get around the world on a bus sometimes, right? Uh, data gets around inside a computer on a bus, but instead of it being a bus with four wheels, it's just a bunch of wires, right? And so if you look at the bottom of, mo of a motherboard, or even this one, if you were to really zoom in, you'd see little tracings of lines, and those would be buses. They're just wires. So, you know, like a cel accelerated graphic port or a universal serial bus, USB, universal serial bus, or Thunderbolt, those would be examples, right? Just, you know, different things. And then we talk about how fast is data, we talk about bandwidth. So you hear this when you're talking about, hey, how much bandwidth do I got on, you know, broadband, you know, how much am I paying Comcast or whatever? You're basically talking about how many zeros and ones can pass through, you know, at a certain, in a certain period of time. So it's, you know, basically, you know, the width, bus width, and the speed equals bandwidth or throughput. The bus width is just like how many zeros and ones could go down the wire and how quickly. Uh, so we saw expansion slots and cards. They allow you to expand the capabilities of your computer, right? So I could plug in a card to allow my computer to do some new piece of functionality and, and access that. So there's an expansion card for like graphics or something. And here's one for USB 2 way back in the day. And uh, back at computer, you have a bunch of ports and connectors. Right? And so you can plug different crap in. Basically, everything's USB these days, thank goodness. But those are like some old school pictures right there. That's the way it used to look. So anyhow, man, that's like, chap that's like week two for me, you know, showing you what computers are like. Anybody have any questions? Why is my mouse funny? How many people is like, wow, that's a fire hose? That's a lot to take in. No, you guys are all good? Good. What's up? Um, um, the 
Sure, yeah, you just go into Blackboard and it'll be up in a you know, probably this weekend or something, but but under lectures in Blackboard I'm actually yeah, I'm at the right one. And then you click on lectures and then lectures to watch. And like, you know, you'd go to week two, but here's week one, and then here's the lecture from last week, you know. And if you're in my online class, you could just watch this one at the top, or you could pick through each of these ones down below. There's stuff in here that I don't cover in class, which you might be interested in, even in in-person class. What's the difference between CC and BCC? This game is called The Truth Will Save You, right? Because if you rate, I'm going to ask you, if you don't know, if you don't know what BCC is, raise your hand. And if your hand is up, I will not call on you to explain BCC. The truth will save you. If you don't know what BCC is, raise your hand. Check that out. Check that out. All right, somebody who does know BCC, tell us what it is. This is, you know, this is the gym. If you don't work out and participate and get active, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get your mind in shape. Say it's what is BCC? Yes, like CC is carbon copy. Yeah. So sending a copy to somebody else. Yeah. Is uh, BCC something to do with like a group carbon copy or something? Uh, so BCC is blind carbon copy. Oh, okay. And uh, and so if I'm oh, emailing, so the person doesn't tell me know. your name again. David. If I'm emailing David, if I and uh, and I don't I don't want David to know. That I'm also, what's your name? Patrice. Patrice? That, you know, I'm emailing David and I'm talking about some plans for Friday night and I want Patrice to see it, but I don't want David to know that I also sent a copy of this to Patrice, then I BCC Patrice, right? And, and David will know it also sent a copy to Patrice, blind carbon copy. And that comes back from carbon copy, blind carbon copy. Back in the day when you make a copy of a piece of paper, you piece, put a piece of carbon between it and then type it. And they type it twice. Stupid. Old. Last class we took up the, um, my teacher taught us mm -hmm. that for when we're sending stuff, homework to other teachers. It's like a receipt. Make sure so the teacher says, no, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. You can show that you did send it to her because you got it back. Oh, you BCC yourself? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah it's, it's, you could also yeah. just go look in your sent folder. <laughs> yeah, but it, so, hey, sometimes man. it doesn't. Like you know, some a lot of teachers. Yeah, I did it this summer because we had accelerated classes, and she said, "No, I didn't. See, I didn't get it." I said, "Yeah, I sent it to you," and I said, "See, here it is, right here. I got it back." So That's why I like the Blackboard deal. It's like you upload your stuff, and I don't know, it's either there or it's not. And if it's not there, well, then upload it again. So there's some good videos down here. You know, uh, you know. Copy and paste, you know, uh, right clicking screenshots, making better choices, right? Like you might find some of that stuff interesting, which I haven't covered in class. You know, not to mention some of these other ones I like, the time you have in jelly beans. Life's short, dude. Life is short. Anybody lost, well, that's of course, never mind. But you realize that as soon as you lose somebody and you're like, whoa, that person was like, that could have been me. Life short. I'm just looking for chapter two keywords. Let's see what we got. Whoa! Look at all those keywords. That's a lot. So we're going to have to go full screen on this. Uh, so, aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is the ratio of height to width on a screen, right? And so there's like, you know, uh, uh, like, hell, aspect ratio. Yeah, so here are different aspect ratios, right? And you've got like the full square screen or you got the landscape screen. And, uh, and so these are the different aspect ratios. So here's a good one. Like this is the old, monitor, here's the more widescreen monitor. So that's aspect ratio. Binary digit, we already know that. Binary language, zeros and ones, also called machine language. Bluetooth technology, um, you know, that's just allows different devices to connect with each other. So your phone has Bluetooth, allows you to connect to the car. Um, a byte, what's a byte? B-Y-T-E, what's a byte? Eight bits. Eight bits, eight bits. The central processing unit, or the CPU, that's where all the main components are put together for doing processing, right? 
Cloud storage is just like storing things on somebody else's computer. So Google Drive, you know, is like storing things in the cloud. So here I'm at Drive with a whole bunch of files and things. That's cloud storage. Um, a cold boot, I don't know, who cares about that? Compact disk, computer, connectivity port, uh, data. So sometimes talk about the difference between data and information. Right, data would be just like everybody's age. Information would be the average age. You know, we took the data and we processed it to turn it into information. Ergonomics is uh, building things to work well with humans. Ergonomics. So just let me show you that word so you can see it because it's a weird sounding word. Ergonomics. Ergonomics, the study of people's efficiency in their working environment. So you want to make sure you have an ergonomic workstation. Because you could hurt yourself if you're not using your computer correctly. So when you're typing, you do not want to put pressure right here because that's going to give you carpal tunnel syndrome. You've got nerves that will get damaged if you prolonged put pressure right there. Keep your wrists flat when you're typing. Keep them off of a surface. And that means often, like, this is horrible ergonomic setup. Like, your keyboard should be on your lap. So when you're sitting, it's all relaxed right here. There's no bend in my wrist, no pressure. I'm typing right there. So keyboard drawers that go up and down and articulate are good. A chair that goes up and down so you can get comfortable in your chair, right? That's going to help keep your body healthy. You don't want to be looking at things up here. You want to look here or down. So people who have their TVs up above their fireplace, and I know there's probably some of you right in this, and you're watching TV like that, that's bad for your neck, right? You've probably experienced that if you've watched like a lot of TV, you're like, oh, my neck or you, you're just laying back on your couch so that you're actually getting this angle, <laughs> right? Because that doesn't feel good to have our head like that. And it'll screw you up over time. Uh, Ethernet is uh, this blue cable stuff right here that allows us to connect our computers together. Um, a gigabyte, we talked about that. Hard disk drives. HDMI, high-definition high multimedia interface, is another type of connector cable. And I think we have an HDMI right here. It looks like this. So it allows me to... That doesn't really show much right there. It allows me to connect, like, my computer to a monitor or, you know, DVD player to TV, TV or something. So it talks about input devices. So we'll categorize devices by whether they're input device or an output device. So input device would be like keyboard, microphone, mouse. Output device would be monitors, speakers, printers, right? Storage device would be hard disk drive, flash drive, CD, DVD. Processing is just the CPU. Um, Mainframes are big computers used by large companies. And then uh, supercomputers are computers used by scientists to run really big problems. So supercomputer, were you texting? No? Okay. I saw you looking down. I thought, I was getting excited. I'm like, sweet, somebody couldn't take it anymore. They had to check their phone. <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about they sometimes categorize things as impact printers or non-impact printers. So an impact printer would be like an old dot matrix printer where you actually hit the page and a ribbon in between with some kind of a, and it makes noise. And then a non-impact printer is like an inkjet or laser printer. I guess a pen plotter is an impact one. Yeah, that would be a good categorization. Your operating system is... Uh, you know, the, the software that makes your system operate. That's why it's called the operating system. So Mac OS X or Windows or, two, or Linux are common operating systems. A pixel. <clears throat> a pixel is a picture element. These are just, you know, things you learn in this chapter. And uh, a pixel is a picture element. Pixel define. A minute area of illumination on a display screen, one of many from which an image is composed. So we make this image up of a bunch of small dots, right? And so it's kind of like pointillism in art, where they made art 
just from a bunch of small dots, right? It's like, and if you get too close to this, all you see are dots. Doesn't make any sense. But you know, if you zoom away, those dots start to, you know, your eye just merges it all together. It becomes an image. And so we make uh, images out of pixels or dots. So the screen's made up of a whole bunch of pixels and uh, picture elements. That's what it stands for. And um, if you get close enough to it, you can see it up here. You can see oh, little squares of color. A QWERTY keyboard. So if you look at the top of the keyboard, it's Q-W-E-R-T-Y at the top left row of keys. So they call this a QWERTY keyboard. It's not the most efficient keyboard. There's a more efficient keyboard called a Dvorak. So if you don't know how to type yet, you might say, okay, I don't know how to type. I'm going to start carrying a Dvorak keyboard around with me, and I'm going to learn on Dvorak keyboard. Because once you do learn how to type, you'll be faster on a Dvorak than you will be on a QWERTY. However, because everybody in the world uses QWERTY, you're going to have to carry a keyboard with you <laughs> wherever you go, right? And uh, I don't know, it's classic human inefficiency. We have random access memory, read-only memory. Volatile storage, cool. All right, yeah, so you got most key terms. Drew them all together in one big picture, hopefully, for you, where it's uh, making sense, you know, and like, oh, great, cool, I understand how computers work. Uh, Q&A, anybody got questions? Need anything repeated? All right, so I got questions for you. Uh, in your group, uh, you're each going to take a turn talking, right? And so uh, the ones will be closer to this side, and the higher numbers will be closer to that side. So I'll say one, answer this question, two, answer this question, three, answer this question, four, answer this question. And if you're only a group of three, when it gets to four, any of you can answer, okay? You can just talk about it. And then once the person is answered, I want you to, uh, uh, the person will say, oh, this is kind of how I understand it, right? And then after that person's answered, you could all sort of chime in and say, yeah, and I think also this piece is important, or whatever you want to add to it. All right, questions for you guys to sort of reinforce what you're learning. Because anytime you want to learn something, what did my teacher say? You know, if you want to learn something, I don't know if I told you this, drop by drop, the bucket gets filled, right? Drop by drop, the bucket gets filled. And time on task, that's all it takes, is time on task. My, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book, What Makes Somebody Successful? 10,000 uh, 10, hours? 10,000 hours. It's four hours a day for 10 years. Right? And uh, that, then you'll become an expert at something. And so it's just time on task. And I kind of also like to think about it like my dog. The more you want something to stick, the more you got to roll around in it. <laughs> right? So this will allow you to roll around in it more. So, all right, so uh, number one, you're going to answer this question. And uh, the question is, how do computers work? Go. Tell it to your group how computers work, number one.